You're listening to The Reality Check, episode 397, recorded April 11, 2016. This is your Reality Check. Hi everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, your weekly Canadian podcast that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. I am your host, Darren McKee, and with me, as usual, are Adam Gardner. What's up, Q-Droids? Christina Roach. Hello. And Pat Roach. Hi, everyone. But not as usual, we have special guest, Jim Davies. Good day. (laughs) Good day to you, Jim. We have a great show for you today. Christina is going to talk to us about misleading terms in the psych field. And Adam is going to explore some Star Wars myths. Indeed. But you don't have to wait that long for Star Wars-related content, fortunately, because we have Jim, professor of cognitive science and studier of imagination and lover of Star Wars, who's been on a couple times to talk about bicycle helmets and his book, Riveted, is going to talk to us about Star Wars droids. Yes. Star Wars is a a science fiction film franchise and uh, also has other media ambitions. And uh, in Star Wars, there are artificial intelligences, almost always embodied in robots, and they are called droids, which is short for android. And um, it's uh, interesting that they um, are almost never disembodied. We, we don't really have like uh, things like the Star Trek computer. Uh, we, <clears throat> in the movies and TV shows, we never get any that are indistinguishable from humans, mm-hmm. like there are in Alien or... Uh, Blade Runner or something like that. They're almost always very uh, boxy-looking, traditional robot-looking creatures. Um, And they all have names that are combinations of letters and numbers. So uh, it's um, kind of interesting to think about the psychology of these droids, right? So there are two aspects that I want to talk a little bit about. One of them is what what are the minds of these droids like? And the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is why do we respond to, as audience members, why do we respond to these droids the way we do? So uh, to talk a little bit about uh, droids, they certainly seem to be able to think by any reasonable uh, definition of the word. Uh, You can find droids that can do just about any cognitive task, including planning and uh, tactical warfare and medical stuff. And uh, some droids are the size of little spaceships and they fly around and and fight and they can talk and do all kinds of stuff. So they certainly can think uh, and... uh, in our culture, it's traditional to think of thinking and feeling as very separate things. Whether or not it is, is a little bit contentious in cognitive science. Um, uh, it is a little bit hard to imagine. You'd have to come up with something a lot like emotion if you want to do things like motivation and other things that are semi-emotional but aren't really easy to uh, put your finger on. But if we want to talk about emotions in particular, they certainly many droids seem to certainly express emotion. So particularly... Mm-hmm. The um, <clears throat> probably the second most popular droid in the series, C-3PO, expresses a lot of fear and anxiety and joy and these kinds of things. He seems like a very anxious robot. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. anxious. He's he's, a, <laughs> he's uh, displays this stuff, right? So, um, and then uh, R2D2, the droid hero of the films, <laughs> yeah. um, he also is capable of a lot of intelligent. Uh, behavior, um, and we we can't understand what he says because he's using a language that they call binary. But uh, we can tell that from his prosody that he gets emotional. So we can tell that he's like chuckling or scared or happy or something like that. He also always seems to be one step ahead of C three PO too. <laughs> yeah, three PO is not a, a super. He's not particularly smart. He's a he's good at translation, but he's uh, pretty dysfunctional otherwise. <laughs> I do find it interesting that it seems the characters can understand what he says, though. Okay, that's so. Um, some of them can, and some of them cannot. Mm. So, uh, particularly um, Anakin and Luke can understand the droids, cool. which might explain why they are so uh, dedicated to, uh, particularly R two D two's welfare. Yeah. Um, Chewbacca also takes great, great pains to save C-3PO. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi doesn't seem to care about droids at all. No. And he can be quoted as saying, you know, if droids could think, where would we be? And <laughs> I remember shaking my head in the theater thinking, what a jerk. But, um, and he also, uh, I, he, he almost never seems to be able to understand what the droids are saying. There's only one time that maybe in episode two on Geonosis, mm-hmm. when he seems to respond to something that R4 says or whatever. But he basically never seems to be able to speak to droids. Now, Anakin and Luke grew up with droids, and maybe that's why. But as we know, being able to understand 
somebody, what they say and the articulateness of their speech does engender empathy and uh, attributions of intelligence. So um, it could, we could par partially describe some of the behavior of the characters to uh, droids based on um, uh, you know, their ability to relate to them. <clears throat> now, can they, can they suffer? That's an interesting thought. Uh, uh, Star Wars is a bit inconsistent about this. There is a scene where a droid gets tortured oh, yeah. in Return of the Jedi. They uh, are lowering a heated something onto the feet of a, a power droid. It's basically a walking battery. I'm not sure what he could have done wrong, but they're <laughs> missing Jabba's palace. They're torturing a battery, and it screams, and C-3PO says, oh, dear. But on the other hand, C-3PO doesn't ever... He just feels mild annoyance when his head gets torn off or uh, <laughs> you know other things. Yes. He, he doesn't seem to respond with pain ever. The oh dear is almost similar then, you're right, for the other droid being tor tortured and his own head being removed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's right. Like, oh dear, look, look at this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Um, hmm. So, you know, uh, and, and whether or not robots could in principle feel pain is a contentious issue in, in uh, philosophy. It's not particularly a psychology problem yet, partially because we aren't exactly sure what pain is or should be. Um, and if we define it biologically, then it's pretty clear that they could never feel pain. Uh, if we define it functionally, it's not clear if we already have things that can feel pain. So, right. Some uh, might say we are robots that feel pain. So, well, there's that non, too. There's non biological that too. But, robots. Uh, I mean, if you make a robot that tries to, it, I mean, it wouldn't be very hard to make, well, we have made artificial intelligences in video games that try to avoid getting hurt. Yeah. Um, so if if they've got a system of, you know, if they've got some variable, for example, that is how hurt they're getting and they're working to lower that variable, uh, functionally that could be described as pain. So then you can uh, think about the ethics of playing video games. For those who happen to be curious about that, Brian Tomasic, who was on the show talking about wild animal suffering, has also done some research on whether video game characters can suffer. So if you want to Google that, you can check that out. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people don't agree at all, of course. Does he think some of them can suffer? He thinks it's getting there, and it will get there. Yeah, well, I think it will get there for yeah. sure, but um, uh, there are a lot of smart people who disagree with me, so I'll say that. Um, so uh, how, how about how we feel about droids? So the... We certainly feel something about droids. One thing that Star Wars does, one thing I think that's really great about Star Wars as a franchise is that all the humans and all the aliens and almost all the robots are basically people. They have recognizable human psychology. Uh, Lucas never really tries to do anything really strange uh, with psychology. It's, um, you know, like Star Trek would sometimes explore, like, oh, this alien is so different and da 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 da. In Star Wars, they're all basically. People, they're recognizably humanoid in their psychology. We can understand how they work. They have greed. They have desires. They have hope. They have other kinds of things. This includes most of the droids. Um, and people react badly to, um, you know, droids getting hurt. So they've done some interesting experiments in the real world. Um, they, uh, there's a robot toy called Pleo, and um, they, they, ran, they had an experiment where they shocked and beat Pleo, yeah. and they would show people these videos, and they, uh, they, they, the people didn't like it. Okay, yeah. they didn't want to watch it, even though they knew, they knew to some degree that Pleo was just a robot toy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th they didn't like it. Okay, and I think that people can imagine. You know, there are videos you can watch. There's YouTube videos of like burning and tickle me Elmo, where it's like burning and saying that tickles, that tickles, and <laughs> <clears throat> it's not funny. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> people, people are disturbed by it. And the reason we're disturbed by it is because, you know, we didn't evolve. We didn't evolve with robots and we're not, you know, we, it just, it's, it, it triggers a lot of the reactions we get when we watch people. You know, that's why when we watch a cartoon of somebody getting hurt, we can feel an emotion about it. So a lot of our, uh, the way we reason about human beings gets triggered by the behavior of these droids, sometimes the looks of the droids. Um, and uh, there, I, there's an article uh, some people get attached to their Roombas, mm -hmm. so people are getting. Uh, some, I, I saw one study about people loving their iPhones, like literally loving them, and like they were doing brain scans of like Whoa. the brain areas or whatever. So <clears throat> I can't quit you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, so they've also done st interesting studies in the human computer interaction world. This guy named uh, uh, these two named Reeves and Nas. Uh, they did these great social psychology experiments where they, they basically replicated social psych experiments with 
computers. So what they would do is they'd bring somebody in the lab and they'd put a blue armband around their arm and and then and then show them a couple computers and, and one of the computers has a blue band around the monitor and they say, okay, that blue computer's on your team and the red computer's on the other team. Mm-hmm. And then they evaluated spell checkers. And so they, and people consistently liked better and thought the blue computer caught more errors. And of course it was the same exact program. Wow. Um, and, are so and weak. They wrote a whole. They wrote a whole book about this called the Media Equation, and it's basically them replicating every social psychology experiment they could think of with computers. And of course, people deny all of it. Like, no, of course not. No, of course that had nothing to do with it. That's stupid. Yeah. But in the aggregate data, we can see that people do favor it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's just a that's a spell checker, right? Oh, they all, just just I can't resist. They they also say, well, spell checkers. Like, we know from social psychology, if you compliment people, they like you better. And with spell checkers, like the worst, like it tells you you spelled your, your own name wrong. So they they made a spell checker that would be like, you spelled this word correctly. Good job. That's a hard so word. Nice. And people uh-huh. then people liked it better and thought it caught more errors too. So uh, <laughs> that is uh, basically what's going on when we um, are looking at the droids. We 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 think of them as human. We don't even a lot of people don't even question it that that we feel bad for the droid or we we get excited for R two D two or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there are things working against it. Now, they don't look just like people. They look a little bit like people, but they're basically mechanical. They're, they're made of metal. They don't have true facial expression for the most part. And that has a dehumanizing effect. So we got that working at cross purposes. Uh, and we would feel more strongly about them if they looked more human. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking of the robot in Ex Machina, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, we won't talk about the Uncanny Valley because that's very scientifically contentious, but. You know, basically, if it looks a little bit more human, it'll trigger more of those things. Um, and you can see how Star Wars, as well as a million other movies, take advantage of this to dehumanize the things that have to get killed. So, stormtroopers, for example, uh, we never we never see their faces in the original trilogy, for example. Um, and I actually, as a five year old or six year old, thought they were robots, and I wondered oh, when wow. Luke put on the costume what he did with all the machinery inside <laughs> so you know and wearing masks not only makes it easy to it makes it easy for us to hurt somebody in a mask and not mind if they get hurt mm-hmm. but also the anonymity if you're wearing a mask or sunglasses you're more willing to hurt other people so it's a really a, a empathy killer <laughs> both, wa- both, both ways yeah. both ways yeah um now you know Lu- and, and you know if i could speculate a little bit on what george lucas was thinking in the clone wars he had this problem of the he had to have jedi killing massive amounts of enemy combatants Mm -hmm. and you know think about how different it would have felt if the jedi were just like hacking down you know countless living beings whether they're human or aliens so what did he do he made droid armies right and the droids now the droids of the droid armies we don't feel that much sympathy for and that's I, I speculate that that's because basically they're well they're made to be villains they have low guttural voices they uh, um, and when they get hurt, it's often used for humor. So when the when the when the battle droids get killed, they go uh oh, and you know <laughs> then they die. Every, Adam's laughing right now. So uh, you know they all it, it, they, it, the movie manipulates you to make you care less about them because otherwise it could be a very disturbing film. But you know there's no you know we sit back and think about it like this poor battle droid yeah. is a sentient being in in many. In right. many ways, but they get very casually killed. It's, it's based programming is no different than C3PO or R2. Probably. Right. It's, it's a parallel that makes me think of the Ninja Turtles cartoon I watched as a kid, that they, Ninja Turtles had all these weapons, oh, yeah, yeah. which are delightfully violent if you're a child, and of course they fought robot foot soldiers, because yeah. otherwise you could not show that to children. <laughs> right, right. So that's the basic part of uh, my analysis of droid psychology, and um, happy to chat about it. I feel Adam should get the first chance. I was wearing an R two D two T shirt. Everybody, yeah. I actually thought he was R two D two, but then I realized Adam's taller than R two D two, so S- slightly. <laughs> he could have been two R two D twos in a trench coat. <laughs> so I found this analysis very interesting. I, I read read your your article you'd written about it, <clears throat> um, because in sci fi, robots are often shown um, sort of you know people won't care about robots, and that's the problem with the future. And the flip side of that is this idea that. Um, People have empathy for their Roombas and other robots, and I kind of had bought on to that idea. But even just looking at Star Wars, we can see that that's not the full story. So it's sort of like people care about it when they want to, or they care about it when it's convenient, and they don't when it's not, and they don't when it's convenient. Right, it's and just I can like see people. this as being a problem in the future of AI. Or oh, well, it maybe, is a but, but with what Star Wars does is it basically treats them like people. Some you hate, some you don't, right? Yeah. So the Stormtroopers, you, you 
you're happy to see them get picked off. Um, but what's interesting about Star Wars is that, and Lucas pretty much said this when he was selling the franchise, he said, you know, it's, it's a soap opera. It's a family saga. It's a family soap opera. It's yep. not really about science fiction. It's not about the spaceships. And, uh, you know, a lot, you know, I'm a writer too, and you hear people say, well, why does it have to be science fiction? Like, science fiction has to be an important aspect of it. Star Wars, I think, is, is a somewhat interesting counterexample. I think a lot of that would translate to another genre. Basically, the, the spaceships and everything is not what the story's about. Mm-hmm. And if it, if it does have to be what the story's about, it's usually about the problem. That's why we have so many tech gone wrong stories. Is yeah. because it's the plot generator, right? But in Star Wars, it's not. Yeah, it's family drama. You could have you could have it be with um, you know swords and shields instead of lightsabers, and it yeah. wouldn't be that different at, at its core. Right. right. I think it's interesting, and you guys can provide more knowledge base on this. That it seems, for the most part, that droids are slaves. They are property that is owned. Is there an instance where there seems to be some autonomous robot sentient entity? That seems to exist on its own as its uh, as its, as non property. Yes, absolutely. So droids are you for the most part follow the instructions of their masters. So that's the word that gets used. And if you if you read the uh, Star Wars and philosophy book, there's a whole article about examining their slavehood. Um, but it's it's unclear how the ownership of the droids is transferred, uh, actually. And uh, there's some confusion about that. And and R two D two disobeys his new master Luke to obey his old master Leia. And C three PO says, "Oh, he's your master now. You need to follow." You know. So there's this. It's not really clear. You know uh, how that's supposed to work. But there are um, masterless droids, and particularly two of the bounty hunters that everyone loves so much, Forlom and IG eighty eight. Don't need to explain who they are. Um, <laughs> uh, they are masterless, so they're, they're bounty hunters who appear with Boba Fett. They have no lines, but they're famous anyway. So um, they are they are masterless. They're on their own. They're bounty hunters. They're so they're shooting people for money. They're ca- catching people for money. That's Re- what those droids are doing. Revenge, huh. freeing their brethren, perhaps. I do think it's interesting in terms of psychology, though, that while we think they can probably do advanced reasoning, for the most part, we don't think they've been suffer. And I think most people watching it don't think there goes someone who's a slave, seemingly happy. Yeah. When they're watching the yeah. movie, right? That yeah, they act, and they, you know, in the in episode one, they actually talk about slavery, and yep. you know, uh, Anakin and his mother are slaves, and one can be freed and the other can't, and blah blah. No one, no one says a word about the droids, yeah. who are <laughs> basically, you know, in the ship, you know, whatever, not allowed to leave, and uh, yeah, a slave, a slave class. I know that Bill Hader uh, was involved in voicing BB-8. Basically, he was. Um, Making the beeps and bops that 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 drone made, and trying to humanize it. Like, how much of that plays a role? So the the speaking of binary has a prosody to it, as we say in psychology and linguistics. It's like the uh, the sing songiness. Uh, so you know, like when you say I don't know, you go and you can often go, huh, and everyone knows exactly what you mean because right. of prosody. So so R two D two has prosody. Um, some droids don't, or they're just speaking with an affect-free tone. So it's basically, you know, R two D two is is an emotional. He's an emoter. That's like all he can do communication-wise. He, he all he can do is, I mean, to the audience anyway. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, the way he the way he beeps and boops. So he's a little cold when <laughs> when uh, C three PO gets his mind wiped. R two D two chuckles. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, if you look at the um, the subtitles. It says chuckling sound. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, so see through. So they say, "Oh, have the have the protocol droids mind wiped?" And R two D two is like, Bah! or something like that. And I think that's that's he's a cold fish. It's wow. just like killing him, basically. Just, it is, ba- yeah, it is kind of like his... killing him. And 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 another interesting question is why why don't they clear R two D two's mind? Like that's, I think there's a plot reason. I don't think people would like that. I think they think it's funny. I think they can laugh at C three PO, but I think they would be a little offended if. R two D two got his mind wiped, but I, why why Bail Organa decides to do one and not the other is unclear to me, and maybe underestimates R two. For me, I think it's more the relationship between the droid and the actor. It's how that actor responds to the droid and interacts with the droid that elicits feelings from me that um, that make the droid more human. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't write about that, but I think that's a good point that we we read other people to see how to react to things and right. when other people are caring that we care too. Thank you, Jim, for the overview and analysis of droids and their psychology. Of course, there's other terms in psychology that end up misleading us. Christina, can you elaborate? 
On the show last week, I did a segment about misleading headlines, if you guys remember. So I thought I'd keep with the theme this week and tackle the most inaccurate or misleading psychological and psychiatric terms that people use, I guess in honor of having Jim on the show as well. I came across a fascinating article published last year in the largest and second most cited psychology journal, Frontiers in Psychology. The article's title, 50 Psychological and Psychiatric Terms to Avoid, a list of inaccurate, misleading, misused, ambiguous, and logically confused words and phrases. The objective of the authors of the article is to foster clarity in the field of psychological science regarding mental phenomena and how it's reported by curbing misinformation and confusion in terminology use. They outline a provisional list of 50 commonly used terms in psychology, psychiatry, and allied fields that they suggest should be avoided or used sparingly with explicit caveats. The article is targeted at students and instructors and researchers um, and to provide them corrective information organized into several categories such as inaccurate or misleading terms, frequently misused terms, ambiguous terms, etc. They explain why the term is problematic in each example and cite one or more examples of its misuse. So for the sake of time, I plucked out four examples out of the 50 that I thought were pretty interesting and that we hear thrown around a lot. But I recommend checking out the full list, which I link to in the show notes at trcpodcast.com. It's a great website. website. Sounds like a good list. I haven't even heard it yet. Okay, so number one, a gene four. We've heard this a bajillion times. News media is brimming with reports identifying genes for a myriad of phenotypes, including personality traits, mental illnesses, and even homosexuality and political leanings. A phenotype is defined as the observable physical or biochemical characteristics of an organism as determined by both genetic makeup and environmental influences. As an example, The Telegraph ran a headline in 2010 that read, liberal gene discovered by scientists, as in liberal leaning, politically leaning. However, because genes code for proteins, there are actually no genes for phenotypes, including behavioral phenotypes per se. In fact, genome-wide association studies of major psychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, suggest that there are probably few or no genes of major effect, unlike single-gene medical disorders such as Huntington's disease or cystic fibrosis. Number two, antidepressant medication. This one I found particularly interesting. Medications such as tricyclics and selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors are routinely referred to as antidepressants. These are medications often used to treat anxiety-related disorders like panic disorder or obsessive-compulsive disorder. Yet some people may be surprised to learn that there's little evidence that these medications are more effective in treating mood disorders. It seems the term was derived more from historical precedents than scientific evidence since the initial evidence for their efficacy stemmed from research on depression. Some authors argue these medications are considerably less effective than commonly claimed and are beneficial for only severe depression, rendering the label of antidepressant potentially misleading. I link to another abstract in uh, PubMed that says calling these medications antidepressants may make sense from a marketing standpoint, but may be really misleading from a scientific perspective. So can I just try to clarify, are you saying, number one, it's not quite accurate because they don't actually, you know, counteract depression itself, which is why they're not antidepressants, as well as they're used for other things, not just depression? Correct. Number three, brain region X lights up. Many use this phrase in popular and academic literatures, which the authors of the article say is unfortunate for a few reasons. I'm sure you guys have heard that before. Mm -hmm. First, the bright red and orange colors seen on functional brain imaging scans are actually superimposed by researchers to reflect regions of higher brain activation, which may give one the perception of lighting up. Secondly, the activations represented by the colors don't necessarily reflect neural activity, but reflect oxygen uptake by neurons, which are at best indirect proxies of brain activity. Another point they raise is that depending on the neurotransmitters released and the brain areas in which they're released, the regions that are activated in a brain scan are actually being inhibited rather than excited. So from a functional perspective, these areas are actually being lit down (laughs) rather than lit up. And finally, the term hardwired, a very popular and widely used term, not only in media coverage, but also academic writings in reference to human psychological capacities that are presumed by some to be partially innate, like religion, prejudice, cognitive biases, or aggression. 
One example cited of its use is a study published in 2006 where the author team looked into gender differences in processing broadcast news, suggesting males may be more hardwired for negative news. That sentence was actually in the study's title. However, growing data on neural plasticity suggests that with the possible exception of inborn reflexes, remarkably few psychological capacities in humans are genuinely hardwired. Furthermore, virtually all psychological capacities, including emotions and language, are modifiable by environmental experiences. So there you go. Those were just a little handful of things that I thought were pretty interesting that I thought I'd cover. No, I think it's great. And you're right. The language is important and we can try to be more precise or accurate or calibrated, depending on what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And things aren't usually hardwired, but there may be large genetic predisposition or tendencies, but it's probably better to use such phrases as opposed to saying something's truly hardwired. Well, and I guess we can't really blame media in all of these cases, too. If if this article is targeted towards um, researchers, students, teachers, yeah. uh, and they're using terminology that is actually misleading, then we can't really blame, um, you know, a science writer when he says hardwired in a headline or gene four in, a, in a, a headline as well, right? So thank you, Christina. And as I sit here in between two gentlemen with Star Wars related t-shirts, one can't help if they have a larger hard wiring for an affinity for Star Wars. Because we now have our second Star Wars segment of the day. Mm -hmm. Adam, can you tell us some myths about Star Wars? Sure. Star Wars has been around for nearly 40 years now. The films are a big part of popular culture, which means that naturally there are truths and myths that have come up surrounding the film. I've been a fan of Star Wars since literally before I can remember, so I've heard some of these when I found a couple of lists and some of them I'd never heard of, so I figured a simple way to separate the noteworthy from the silly was to focus on ones I'd actually heard of. I'd be curious if any of you would have heard these as well. In the first film, one of the supposed goofs had actor Mark Hamill, that's Luke Skywalker, if you didn't know, saying Carrie instead of Leia at the end of the film. This would be Carrie for Carrie Fisher, the actress who played Princess Leia. A friend first pointed this out to me when we went to see the re-releases in 1997, and I've listened really hard for it every time I've seen the movie since, most of these being pre-special edition versions, but a little both, and I never really picked up that specific sound. Mark Hamill claims that he was saying, there she, as part of there she is, and he says the whole scene was looped, meaning that the sound was added in post-production, not during the actual recording of the scene, um, so it really doesn't make sense that that blooper would have existed and been left in. Ben Burt, who remastered the special editions, went back to the original recordings and said it didn't sound like anything but cheering. Ben Burt, who, by the way, did the sounds for R2-D2. Perhaps the most notorious myth is about Mark Hamill sustaining an injury between the first and second film, which is why he gets hit in the face by a wampa early in The Empire Strikes Back, that being to hide his injury. I'd heard this as a child as my mother explained this to me as the reason for the scene, so it's been floating around since the early 80s at least. Mark Hamill did have a car crash in January 1977, before the first film was released, but after it had been filmed. Director George Lucas denies the validity of the story, and states that any changes to his face have more to do with aging than anything else. There is a close-up of Mark Hamill's face before the attack, which would have been easily avoided if he was really just injured to cover up those scars. All this said, Carrie Fisher remembers things a bit differently. And I quote, I was still shooting Star Wars when Mark got into the car accident. It was a really bad accident. Miraculously, his teeth didn't shatter, but his nose did. He had to have some of his ear put into his nose, so they adjusted the film with this snow monster to right away in the movie scratch his face to account for his looks being different. So there are conflicting opinions, but with the director insisting that this was not the reason, it's possible Carrie Fisher is simply mistaken on this, though there is still some debate to this issue to this day. When Star Wars Episode Two was released, there was a myth that NSYNC were in the movie. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I had heard that they were at the battle on Geonosis, and I looked very closely for them every time I'd seen the movie in the theater since my original viewing, where I hadn't heard this. Uh, and then I again watched on the DVD and paused and looked really hard for them with no success. It turns out that some of them did shoot some scenes, just not the more recognizable Lance Bass and Justin Timberlake. Producer Rick McCollum's daughter was a fan, and so Joey Fatone, his brother Stephen, J.C. Chazez, I hope I'm saying that right for NSYNC fans, and Chris Kirkpatrick filmed two scenes. The bigger scene was during the battle on Geonosis, where they were dressed as Jedi and fighting with lightsabers, 
and that scene was said to have been cut, but some claim that a brief scene still shows them in the background. And there's a GIF in an article that's linked in the show notes um, that's not terribly inconclusive, but it features a Jedi with a shaved head and mohawk, which matches the description of Joey Fatone's character in the scene that he's supposed to be in. The Fatone family said that it does appear to be Joey, but this is not an official confirmation. So, there was some stuff shot. They might have sneaked into the movie, but it's not really something you could ever really notice. I've n- I've never heard that. I'm surprised about NSYNC being mm-hmm. in the film. Well, it wasn't the ones like... It's, it, it's, it's not Justin Timberlake. Right. Now, less of a myth and more of a goof. Um, an episode of the popular TV show, That 70s Show, references Darth Vader as an evil Sith Lord. My brother had mentioned this to me, and we both agreed that this was silly, since Sith was a prequel term and that no one in the 70s should have known of his existence. I did a little research, and indeed the term Sith was first heard on screen during Star Wars Episode One, The Phantom Menace, in 1999. But a note in the script for the original Star Wars film describes Vader's first entrance as, The awesome seven-foot-tall Dark Lord of the Sith makes his way into the blinding light of the main passageway. The term was also used to describe Vader in the novelization of the film and also appeared in some expanded universe works prior to Episode One. All that said, it was a rare term indeed, and one I'd never heard of until the late 90s, so it's unlikely that Topher Grace's character Eric would have used the term during the late 70s in which the show takes place. But if you have friends that say Sith was not introduced in Episode One, I'd heard of it before, I think they may be remembering that accurately. Star Wars is serious business, so keep in mind that Luke doesn't call Leia Carey. The Wampa attack was probably not used to cover Mark Hamill's injuries. NSYNC did film scenes, but nothing or close to nothing remains of that in the film, and it's unlikely that someone in the 70s referred to Darth Vader as a Sith, as the term was not commonly used until its appearance on screen over 20 years later. Unless they read the novelization. Yes. Yes. But I don't know if it would really be something that would be that commonly used as a term. Right? Is people, that is that something you would really commit to memory, even though like the movies continuously refer to them as you know dark Jedi or stuff like that? I know I'd heard it before episode one. Okay, so it was something that was kind of kicking around in your mind. Then. I mean, it wasn't common, but yeah, yeah. People don't read in the seventies, Jim. You know. <laughs> but I'd heard a lot of people say that, and they said, "No, no, it, w- it wasn't from the pr- it wasn't from those movies." And because I had not personally heard it, I thought that would that was silly, but, but it was around, so. So before we wrap up, should we have an hour-long discussion about the movies? <laughs> <laughs> Pat's like, for some premium content, you can listen to the 90-minute show where <clears throat> he falls asleep <laughs> and the rest of them bicker. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not editing the premium content. <laughs> I wanted to quickly mention that the podcast awards are coming around again, and we would love to be nominated in the science category and people's choice category. So if you like the show, you can go to podcastawards.com, nominate the reality check for science category and people's choice. We would love that support. Thank you, listeners, for joining us once again. Uh, we're very happy to have special guest Jim Davies talk to us about the psychology of Star Wars droids and how he showed that we relate to them in various ways because they remind us of ourselves. And Christina for highlighting the importance of language that is used in different psychology research studies and newspaper reports. We should try to be a bit more accurate and precise in terms of what we mean when we're conveying certain thoughts and ideas. And for Adam for rounding out some of the major Star Wars myths that uh, 10% of you care about. <laughs> Until next time, thank <laughs> better to act better peace out cute droids good day stay classy not smart assy happy birthday christine oh thank you the reality check is an independently canadian produced podcast for show notes or to discuss this episode visit our facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com for general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion email info at trcpodcast.com Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TRC underscore podcast. The audience is, is amazed at something, then the thing is amazing. If it's a live audience, then you should be amazed too, right? Maybe it's not exactly. <laughs> Let me introduce oh an idea that disagrees with myself in 30 yeah. seconds. Uh, a, a myriad of phenotypes. Is that how you say that, Jim? Yes. Yep. Myriad is pronounced correctly. No, phenotype. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. That'll be in the outtakes. <laughs>